Welcome to this episode of the Spinoza Triad, where three friends get together to discuss philosophy and hopefully use it to understand the world around them. That's Dr. Richard Miller, Dan Rowland, and myself, John Gibbs. And in this episode, we discuss the philosophy of history. What is history? And can we learn anything from it? I hope you enjoy our discussion. But uh, the philosophy of history. So, it, it, uh, Dan, as you said, it's a huge subject. Let's start with a famous observation about history that um, Henry Ford, it, that all history is bunkum, all history is bunk. So it doesn't mean anything. History, you can't learn anything from history. It's just one, it's, it, it relates to the other thought that um, it was a guy called um, Arnold Toynbee who said, history is just one damn thing happening after another. He didn't actually believe that. What he said, he, he was answering critics who said, if you can't find patterns in history, if you can't find meaning in history, then it, it's just one damn thing happening after another. And that, of course, you know, could be. Maybe that's all history is. History is just event followed by random event followed by random event. What, what, yeah, come on. I was just going to say, what, what do you mean by event, though, John? Because that's quite an interesting place to start I suppose isn't it yeah because you can distinguish between uh, like a volcano going off mm. and say well that's not that's not history because it had no uh, or it had no uh, cause that you could determine mm. it had no um, human action I mean it, it, there's I presume we're going to say there's no history before human beings and there's no history before human beings could write or there's no history before human beings left evidence that you could understand what their motivations were, what they were, what they were about, what their intentions were, what the consequences of what they did, and what they thought about that were. So well, unless you can, unless you can have those things, then history. So yeah. I, so to go back to your answer to the question, Rich, events that are just act, things happening in the world, as opposed to the actions of humans. I, I was just when you say the word event, I, I, I always think of. Um, in, in this context, uh, Alan, Alan Badu, with the the idea of he he talks about events, and his point is how events produce subjects. So you have a subject of an event, uh, and French Revolution is, is one he talks about. You know, it, it's an event that unfolds, and then produces us as subjects of that that event. So you have this kind of couplet of, of an event. And then the subjects of the event, you know, when when, it, when any that... anything unfolds around the world, because I'm, I'm wondering now if you, your example of a volcano that would still be an event because it would be um, there would be subjects to that event. So you've got a series of events unfolding historically, and then you've got the the creation of subjects to that event as well. So it's quite you, 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 you've got a kind of external factor, and you've got a kind of a subjectivity that, that's related to it. I could say, say that that subjectivity then adds to the supposed objectivity of history, because then the subject then reshapes the event itself that occurred, <clears throat> and memory um, plays a vital part of that. And so, mm. memories, most of memory is forgotten. So we choose what we remember. So, in order for history to take place, as it were, for there to be a thing called history. You could have an event that is no point in analysing its causation. It's a volcano, but it, but but it has an effect on human human beings. So then there's the history of them as they are, as they respond to it, as they understand it, as they interpret it, as the as the effect it has on their civilization. So so all all of history is then the sub the subject of history and and the like if I get what bad you is meaning something like you know we we become the subject of history because we. We have to interpret our, ourselves. Like, I'm, I... Sorry, guys. There's a movement. Oh, the moment. Cool. The moment's passed there, Dan. I was so... I had, it was there. The crystal John's, idea. John's just changed <laughs> history with that one. Yeah. What's that? Missed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If I, I don't, I, I, I'm not familiar with... I mean, I'm familiar with the idea of, be, of being the subject. So if I'm the subject of my own past, mm. for instance, yeah. I, I, I have a history. So I, I am the 
I, w- I will understand myself in terms of any, some sort of narrative I'll tell, and I'll yeah. place myself within that narrative of of what led me here, and I know it will help me to understand, and to and it will also cause me to respond to the world around me. So if I'm just one of those, that must be human. Human beings must be continually narrativizing and placing and themselves. It doesn't remain in. fixed. It doesn't remain fixed. We keep no. changing that narrative as we go through our lives. John mentioned, no. you know, you mentioned the word there, context and interpretation. You know, both those words. I mean, they're, 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 uh, they're interesting points here, aren't they? If we have historical events, we have a, con- you know, that they're, they're within a context historically. So if you use your, you know, if you, you were saying, John, about interpretation, the interpretation then will be affected, won't it? The context. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 is, that makes history different from every other subject in a sense. Mm. It's, you're not describing a mm. chemical reaction or you're describing a scientific process. Although, although history clothes itself, it's curious, it clothes itself in the, in the sort of um, attributes of, of science, you know, uh, le- leafing through the archives, d- digging through the soil, finding these things. But then it becomes a matter of, um, inter- you know, the hermeneutics, it, interpretation. You know, mm. What you think that yeah, the, the history, that is. The strange thing is history only exists in the present. Yeah. Yes. You know, the, past, yeah. Yeah. the past doesn't exist. The only yeah. thing, so you've got an epistemological question about history, like, you know, the vibrancy of the current moment uh, cannot be denied, but as soon as it dips into the past, it's disappeared. So it's not there. And so anything we're talking about the past is related to the current moment that we're experiencing now. So mm. in, similar to your idea there, Richard, about how the subject informs the event, that's mm. kind of the thing that's going on with that kind of relationship between our discussions about who we think we are uh, and you see this don't you where we've been you know so we, yeah so where we've been is often in relation to where we are does that kind of make mm. sense yeah well it does i mean what about yeah, example clearly. like uh, sort of i mean we've seen recently haven't you a rewriting of history or, or an, an attempt to rewrite history of colonialism you know through through different perspectives <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that's an example, isn't it? So we, we then become subjects, the, theoretically, if those histories were rewritten, we oh. become subject to those events in a different way, wouldn't we? Yeah. I suppose. Yeah, and it, and it can, and being <laughs> being sort of uh, becoming the subject of history can be can be very very uncomfortable. If if you think, for instance, that in the United States right now there's a colossal sort of um, controversy over um, critical race theory. Mm. The critical race theory simply says this: that race, well, it says a lot of things, but, but in a nutshell, that, re- that race and racism has ru- has run th- right the way through American history, and it's a and it's a, a it's a story of the repression of one race by another. Mm. Now that 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 you say, well, that that sounds like you're saying that America, the United States of America, is a racist country. You say, well, yeah, well, yes, that's that's fair enough. That's true. Doesn't necessarily mean that if you're walking the streets of America right now, you'd be ashamed of being American. But it does challenge your if you if a different interpretation of American history, which is a kind of uh, manifest destiny, the shining city on the hill, the place that is an example to the rest of the world. But if if running through it is a vein of racism, well, then then you know then how do you respond to you to that to that past? Or, or, or no. you shouldn't, you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't respond to it at all. You may, but, but people, people do respond to that because I, I think that's really construct, interesting. Construct. Construct. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think that um, history is really rooted in the idea of identity. People in medieval times and the, the early modern period didn't really see things in terms of events, they just saw an existence unfolding. One of the main reasons for that is because they saw everything in relation to God. And to Christianity, and the individual replaced uh, religion at the centre, and then from that we have the idea of individuality and the idea of individual nations. And, the, uh, and nation stories go hand in hand with personal story. But of course, there is a great Christian narrative of history, and the great Christian narrative of history is that is that, is that the, the world began and the world will end. But yeah. there's an eternity to it. Because it's, well, it's, uh, it's coined around God, so there's a 
The only yeah. story is God's story, and everyone just plays. There's no kind of, you know, it's just it's just one of a history of fulfilment, shall we say, rather than events. God's promise. True, but if um, if, the, if this world, that God's world, is has some, in a Christian sense has a sort of, um, you know, it's the what's it, the veil of souls. You know, we, we are yeah. we are we are forging our souls, and whether we go to heaven or to hell, so there's the individual story that this is some sort of contest. Of, of of soul forging that we're that we're all engaged in, and on the other hand, this we're all on a part process of where all part of God's plan. Yes, but the God's plan clearly has some sort yeah. of you know, there will be a day of reckoning. The trumpet will blow. The souls will be called up from the well. That that's not. I they always think when I listen when I think about that, the sort of beginning and the end of the world, the day of judgment and so on. That there will be an end of history. Well, there you go. That's that's Hegel. Isn't Hegel a secular mysticism of history? I think there's an important shift to where we moved away from religion to the individual. Think about the Romantic period that started in the 18th century under, you know, Rousseau and Wordsworth. There's this move away from the idea of the soul and God and the individual becomes so important. And the idea of the individual narrative becomes important through, you know, Rousseau writing absolutely, Rousseau writes absolutely everything he tries to remember about his life what's the it's it, it's called the confessions he writes the confessions where he re- remembers tries to tries to recount everything that's occurred wordsworth does the same so this is kind of move away from the self which is coined by god to the point the self is then coined or remembered by the self i think that's the shift away Rousseau so needs an Instagram account. It has done pretty well. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But if you read the confessions, he, he says absolutely everything, isn't it? And the idea of the confessional I, I, was a private thing. That, you know, yeah. But you know, I, don't think that's a, I don't think that's such a flippant remark, Rich, because I think that, in a sense, the, 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 the romantic project, project the self-project, and the modernist project of, of yeah. human beings being our own story. Well, that's that's what that's what that's why there's almost an obsessive compulsion to record the moment you're in. I'd Everyone becomes a, a hero you, in their own lifetime. That's true. Although I'd say there was a there was an edge of individualism within Christianity. I mean, you you, you are you are the one the joining Christ, and everyone was on true, the same true. journey. But, but you are you are going to be tempted or not be tempted, presumably. Yeah, but it? you did it not because of anything within your own life. It's because of what, what was written in the Bible. So everyone had the same set of rules. Well, There's the, no the personal problem, rules or anything like this, you know. Well, the problem there, you're, you're absolutely, you're getting into the sort of theological problem of determinism. You know, if, if God knows everything, then God knows whether you're, you well, know, yeah. and, and how that, that, you're well, predestination. That's another podcast. That's another podcast. Yeah, it's another podcast. Yeah. That's the podcast. Yeah, yeah. But predestination, if, if the world is moving from creation to, to fall, to the end of the world, and everyone's story is a temptation that, that they have to overcome, but God knows the outcome of all the stories. Anyone sitting in the, well, they, those young men, those young Hegelians, who sat mm. there in lectures, they're probably, no one can understand Hegel anyway, but anyway, they sat there in those lectures no by Hegel, and they're, in, they're oh, inspired. Because what is he saying? He's, in, he's empowering you to be part of history. The history, I've discovered how history works. It's a process of formation and reformation. It's a, it's a continual process of, of, of internal contradiction and rebellion and tension. And mm. it's moving forward in time. And you are the hero of this story. Well, that's what I'm saying. So no, it's so, a, so no one, absolutely. absolutely. So, so it's a recent thing. So that's, you're talking the 1830s, whatever. Yeah. 1820s, 1830s. And you get the feeling that Hegel, to young Hegelians like Marx, and left Hegelians or right Hegelians, are excited. Oh, yes. No wonder his, no his lectures are absolutely packed. Who was it? Whose lectures did he didn't go to? We were talking about these recently. Uh... Schopenhauer, wasn't it? Schopenhauer, that's right. <laughs> we didn't know he went. <laughs> yeah. yes. I think, I think um, so the, the interesting thing with Hegel is this idea of an unfolding world spirit, this Geist that he talks about. You know, that really history is the unfolding of Geist, spirit, and our kind of... And, and, and by that, as far as I can 
define. Mm. I, I think he. I think he just means a general mood within culture, politics, um, economy of, of a, a kind of um, a move to freedom, isn't it? Geist. Sorry, John. Go on. No, I'll go for the idea that it's a sort of secular mysticism. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, 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 if the geist can mean ghost, geist can mean ghost or spirit. Also in action and practice as well, isn't it? And and, and ourselves within this. I mean, he sort of linking in this kind of idea of history as event and us, our relationship to it, either affecting it or not. He talks about how self-consciousness is coming to know yourself through an other, through through trying to reconcile the, recognise yourself um, in events as they unfold. And the reconciliation of that is, is the movement that he's talking about, isn't it? And and he thinks he thinks ultimately through the state, the state being the ultimate end point for him well i mean it's, it's butchering this slightly but you know that we recognize ourselves with, within within the state so the state would be that would marry up the individual and and the collective and this world spirit that must be in a sense if you take a left hegelian sort of view of that a marxist view enormously empowering i don't know when your first time you came across the ideas of karl marx I mean, there must be some point in your life, isn't it? Like, yeah. But the first time you realise that death is inevitable, <laughs> or old age, or something, you know, there's some point in your life when you're, you know. And I remember t- teaching Marx to students who had no real knowledge of it at all. And so, ah, oh, you can see them going. And I thought, well, this is this is just a repetition. That 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 exhilaration you're feeling that someone has lifted the lid on the way things actually work. Yeah. And they've and they've exposed to you, you know, the ghost behind the machine. You know, okay, it's a secular ghost. It's a ghost of economics. I can tell you how the machine works. It's very, very empowering, very exciting. I yeah, think. it's not. It's not one damn thing happening after another, after all. Well, it's. Yeah. I mean, I think when you say one thing happening after another, I think the interesting point, Hegel's point, which obviously Marx takes, is is this idea of uh, of a dialectic. You know, of, of history moving dialectically, of, of, of there being being one position. And, and trying to reconcile yourself to the other and it moving forward and, and changing and then there being shifts and, and really quite the kind of subtle way in which he weaves the individual into that. The individual is, is recognising themselves within this. The state defines government, uh, but also political, social, cultural and ethical life. He, when he talks about a state, he means how we fit within this and freedom exists through the state. So you, you, you need a state in order to be free. Without that, you end up in a kind of, um, things might not run too well, you know, just the strongest will exist in this kind of thing. But you need, you need some sort of mediating body there. Sorry, so he- yeah. Hegel talks um, very clearly about the past and he says... I wouldn't say he says, talks clearly about anything too well. No, no, not clearly. I mean, what I'm saying, he clearly, I've I rephrased that, he clearly... Um, links his um, theory to a definite past. In other words, he knows the past. He knows what has occurred and how that's shaping the present and the future, wrapping the state up in all that discussion. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Um, It would be fair to say that Hegel's philosophy of history is is of grand systems. He's a universal systems creator. Uh, not it's very universal if you think there's a kind of mysticism the spirit of the world the spirit of the universe that drives everything a kind of goodness or logic or progress or whatever but just in terms of the nation state that the state progresses through a series of historical epochs towards some kind of finality and conclusion and that within that the individual finds their greatest expression their own personal identity well the problem with that is of course that they're going to appeal to left Hegelians right Hegelians and down the road I don't think it would be unfair to Hegel to say that the end point of the grand systems of history are things like fascism and totalitarian Marxism. Which is why you you really do have to be careful what lessons you learn from history. And if you think history is taking you in a certain direction towards perfection, well, watch out for perfection. It always ends up with someone who's imperfect being shot. This is one thing I was struck when 
was the questions about the epistemology of history. Mm. That that really interests me. Is um, we often forget that you know, hi- historians treat that as an irrelevance. I suppose much like a scientist might not be concerned about the about the problems of um, knowledge and philosophy. Yeah. You know, how do you know you're seeing that atom? The historian doesn't raise the question, how do you know that event actually occurred? It's subject to psychotherapy and uh, personal narrative. So if we can talk about nations and, uh, and, and the way in which we understand empire building and mm. national identity, you've got to start at the base roots and start with the individual. And obviously, obviously, we've got you know, there's a massive problem with memory. Which does do. He does oh, yeah. that. In, in, so in, again, I, this has been a question, while since I've read this. But if yeah. you so in the, the phenomenology of spirit, I, I'm pretty sure it's in that he has a whole section on self certainty and and how right. um, how the self comes to know itself through through a recognition of an other. And so you recognise yourself as someone else looking at you. And he, he goes right back to the beginning with it. And there's, there's a whole section there where, where, he, where he, he talks about the self unfolding, subject and substance, you know, how the world around you creates us. I mean, I, I, I think in a kind of, to, to simplify it maybe, the, the argument would be that you would only know yourself through historical formations. You know, it'd be impossible for the, what what we know as a formation of a subject to exist outside of a historical context. Is memory work like that? Is memory sequential like that? I'm just looking at this here from Proust. You know, the, um, in search of lost time, he says this: we relive our past years not in their continuous sequence day by day, but in a memory focused upon the coolness or sunshine of some morning or afternoon. Between these isolated scenes lie vast stretches of oblivion. So he's saying we've got such a selective memory, and even that is then coloured by our current existence, um, that it's almost like an emotional position rather than an objective position. No, I, I just just on sorry, John. Just on that quote there, just quickly. I mean, if yeah. you if you replace the word memory with the word fantasy, and, and reread what what you've just said okay. there, you've got an almost kind of psychoanalytic view of, of yeah. history. I yeah. think there. So you've got, yeah. and 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 really, this is almost an ahistorical um, argument that, regardless of, of when and where, you have this um, this drive for fantasy to pad out the. You know, they use the word inherent failure. The, the, the kind of the void or nothingness which history is trying to make it's sense terrible. of. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, 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 the yeah. dread, if you like, of, of nothingness, the anxiety, yeah. and and that works both. Obviously, with it, you see then a marriage totally of, of historical formations and sub, and formations of the self. You know, or, or the subject, should I say, not the self. Yeah. 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 So yeah. That's, that's, it's almost like a kind of. Um, it, it, it's, it's anti-history, isn't it? That you know, the history becomes a sort of substructure where we can take one view of fantasy, trying to make sense of of, of a void, mm. and and we we I use that. Same yeah. thing for us. I totally agree with that, Rich. Is, is that how do we how have we gone from that to now? If anyone who thinks about history is treated as objective, almost like scientific, as as John said earlier. So we've gone from the psychotherapy view, which perhaps starts with a romantic period, mm. uh, and the idea of the individual, individual states, individual nationhood. Yeah, one more thing about that is that is the purposes of history. And the purposes yeah. of history uh-huh. will, ser- yeah. will serve all sorts of different purposes. And people will use history for their own again, purposes, uh, not yeah. the, way, the, the construction of national identity, to 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 appear to learn lessons from the past, whether it's possible or not, because people, people insist they can learn lessons from the past, you know. And, um, and it, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. People will, will think they all, all the time we're drawing on a series of these inventions and narratives. Now, to go to the point, can can is the past lost completely? 
can we ever understand anything about the past at all? Like like me trying to understand my own childhood. I never really, I can't go back there, I can't relive it. Like, like people will say to you, you know, I had a miserable childhood. Then you meet them years later and say, well, actually my parents talked about it. You know, they were constantly reinterpreting the past. So, so yeah, the past is, the past may be lost. It may be, impo- it may be impossible. So it, it's, it's, so history isn't trying to understand what happened. Even that presents itself to do that, isn't it? it? Presents itself as the as the object the objective analysis of what occurred, but mm. everything occurred. Nothing occurred. It's it's, well, it's, 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 the, it's it's the storytelling of the past that is what history is. It's ideology, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and, and it'll serve yeah. ideological purposes, psychological purposes, individual religious purposes. Yeah. Can I say this? I've, I found this another interesting thing which I found in preparation for this little talk. I keep saying that. Um, <laughs> And then you didn't want to do this to him. He's like, I'm not ready, he says. I'm not ready for this. And another thing. Well, I've got nothing to talk about. And it's got plenty of quotes. I found it fascinating what you've said about about personal uh, you know, memory and, and personal history and lost time. I had no idea that nostalgia was seen as an illness. Did you know this? Like neuralgia. It was, the, the, it, nostalgia was seen as, as one of the worst things someone could get in the 18th century. Oh, he's got a terrible case of nostalgia. And they actually Seriously. believe, this is up to 1945, 1946, people believe you could die of nostalgia. And it comes from Greek nosos, which means return to native land, and algos, which means suffering or grief. And it was uh, first coined as a condition, a medical condition, uh, by Johannes Hoffer in 1688. Didn't know that. Um, and uh, he said some people languished, so I'll read a bit here, languished, wasted away, and even perished. Hoffer saw the illness as a continuous vibration of animal spirits uh, through those fibers of the middle brain in which the impressed traces of the fatherland still cling. And it continued wow. to the point that um, the sound of cowbells. In, in the in Swiss mountainsides could seriously affect the, the movement of troops. And so, <laughs> it's ridiculous, this, the incessant clanging of cowbells in rarefied alpine heights left the Swiss especially vulnerable to damage to eardrums and brain cells. To ward off nostalgia, Swiss soldiers were forbidden to play, sing, or even whistle alpine tunes. Sounds like a Woody Allen film. <laughs> um, what? Sounds- a medication, med- you've got the medicine for nostalgia, which is a you know a, a wonderful thing. Now we see, which shows how we've moved. We celebrate our personal histories, whereas in the past it was seen as something terrible. Medication yeah. included leeches, purges, emetics, and bloodletting. For nostalgia's later stages, Hoffer advised hypnotic emulsions, cephalic balsams, and opium. A Russian general in 1733 found terror efficacious, were buried alive, and after two or three burials, the outbreak of homeless homesickness <laughs> subsided. Well, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because we use... Terrible case we, of nostalgia, we're going to bury well, you alive. Uh, there must be... Uh, fascinating <laughs> oh. stuff, then, isn't it? We, we might, it must be that the, uh, the, the remnants of that... It. it must be that the remnants of that have come down to us in phrases like homesickness. Yeah, where we yeah, will, yeah, yeah. we will say, you know, I feel, I feel, you know, I feel yeah. ill because I, I miss my childhood, I miss my home so much. So that must have been identified yeah. as a. As a I love but now it. we've gone the other way. We've gone to instant nostalgia. It's seen as if you're not nostalgic, you don't have any emotions. You're not very, you're not very uh, linked to. You're not very attuned with your own life. Yes. We have instant nostalgia for COVID now. Yeah, lockdown. Even though it was three years ago. Well, it's, so it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the, you, the breadth of nostalgia is is much shorter. Yeah, I mean, you you could argue that our culture is in a permanent state of nostalgia, in that in that in that it, yeah. it recreates and repastiches everything, everything. It, what is original anymore? You know, we're going to get back to sort of. Is it yeah, yeah, kind of popular will kind of be the whirling in this grave. Seeing how we live now. So, say again, the Dan. whole society is dying of nostalgia. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The, well, the, the the obsessive recording of the moment that's passed. Mm. You know, it's it, it. You do you want to say to people or yourself, indeed, if you're in a museum or an art gallery or watching yeah. a rock concert, live in the moment, live in the moment. Don't 
you actually you're transposing yourself to the moment le- later on when you look back that's on this. That's the key point. You know? So you're trying to record something that's passing, which is yeah. so you you're trying to objectify something which is subjective. Well, and what? and may, maybe there is an illness of nostalgia, and it's a it's a collective illness to society. What, what can we say about the process of collecting the, the histories or history itself? Well, I suppose you've got to think the main thing is, that is, is how much is forgotten. Okay. And, and why is the stuff remembered rather than something else? And I have the whole gamut of, of, of the experience of the past when it was the present. We, we were just... But, um, um, yeah. Before you got on, Ben, uh, sorry, John and I were talking briefly about, uh, yeah. you know, we were just chatting about some general history stuff and um, we mentioned uh, yeah. Foucault's Foucault's histories because yeah. I remember reading um, the opening part of the history of sexuality one where he talks about the he calls it, is it a repression hypothesis he's, he's sort of critiquing this or, mm-hmm. and, he, and he's saying about how the Victorians in actual fact were obsessed with sex and sexuality N- not not because they spoke about it all the time but they, they left it out of the sort of general um, Interesting um, histories, but but spoke about it. Spoke about related things through sort of scientific discourses or language of uh, things that needed correcting and things that needed you know through yeah. a, a, a myriad of different kind of like approaches. But he would. But so his one of his interesting points is you know he, he obviously writes about discourse and language and the relationship between power and knowledge. So there's a power relationship in what's being what's being written. So it's never it's never neutral or never objective in, in in that sense of the word, but but also about what what's left out, what's not said is often saying as much as as, as what is. Absolutely, and I, I think a lovely examples of that is in the nineteenth yeah. century. They're, of course, from really the eighteenth and nineteenth century, to be properly educated, you needed to learn about the Greeks, and you uh, you learn you read you read the histories of the Greeks, you read the Latin, you know all the all the yeah. The Greeks and the Romans. Class, a classical education was what prepared you for some some way of living in 17th and 18th and 19th century Britain to, to know to know to know your classics and to learn yeah. Latin and so on. And yet, in order to do that, you had to jump over a period of time where the where the fall of the classical world had to be seen as a disaster, and what followed it were the Dark Ages. So then you had to classify that bit of history as something not worth knowing. And no memory. Yeah. yeah, no memory of it. So the the, the kind of myth that um, somehow in the eighth and ninth and tenth century there was nothing nothing going on worth noting. Just just people like the Monty Python the Monty Python scenes of people wallowing in mud, hitting mud piles. You know? <laughs> there was nothing. There was nothing going on. And then there's a shining something of that. And then when you dig back into his, you say right, you know, you you, you're, you start looking at the monuments of the past, like the Acropolis or such like. You realise they were brightly coloured. Painted with every, you know, the, the, the eyes of the statues were picked out. The flesh tones were painted on the on the on the statues. The columns were green and scarlet and so on. But that doesn't fit because you want the Greeks to be what you want them to be. You want them to be the heroes of a classical age of re- of reason and rationality, which you see as the origins of what you want this, the, the present to be. So you insist that that you forget that the monuments and the statues were all coloured. And you want then you want when you write the history of Gibbon's history of the Roman Empire, Gibbon's history of the Roman Empire is a lesson in morality for the 18th century young man and people. It's all about a great oh, noble. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it, and, all, all yeah. the way through Gibbon's uh, Roman Empire is a is a series of moments when the Romans right. were no, noble as a republic, not too bad as an early empire that got nastily into orgies and such. <laughs> And that led, you know, you know, there was moral moral decay. And you know, you can say that you can t- you can hear the teacher saying, "And Do Hoskins, let that be a lesson to you, and get your hands above the desk. <laughs> Stop playing with yourself, boy, because that'll what that's what brought the empire down, and so on." Yeah, and is it in relation to Christianity as well? So everything was bad before the year zero, moral decay. Yeah, well, although Gibbon has Gibbon is not happy about Christian Christians, he, he thinks no, Christians were a no. major undermining of the of the classical virtues of discipline, stoicism, self reliance, which are corrupted by too much orgying. But but it, it's not a 
it's not that different from someone like Marx reading into history patterns of history. You know, there are if there are moral progresses, if there are lessons we can learn. The story of history is the story of great people overcoming things and moving forward but and so on. That analysis is saying more about Marx than the events he's trying to describe, or Hegel about the the actual thing he's trying to describe. So, well, that, so history is in the eye of the beholder, but the actual events themselves, you know, are, are not acceptable. Just like I can't access someone else's memories, I shouldn't therefore be able to access the past either, and I can't. I think though, isn't Marx? I mean, Marx is trying to put together a a, 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 a sort of teleological history with an with an, with an end point. He's, he's he's more using history, isn't he? He's using history to sort of yeah. Well, I'm raising that theory question again with that because mm. it, it, it it is Marx it, again. It's that select and it's it's that positioning to say everything is about this theory. Yeah. You know? yes. Um, so you've got you've got um, experimented bias. You can use scientific language there. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's just another thing I <laughs> say again, oh, aren't I? Another on. thing I came oh, across in the little talk. <laughs> but I, but I had I, another thing I was fascinated by is that the the idea of people accepting their story is not going to be recorded and that the past is going to consume them. This is something we're terrified by, but I read here the Swahili, uh, the deceased uh, who remain alive in the memory of others. So so thinking about, you know, when you think about your parents, your grandparents, they would call us as the living dead, not in a zombie sense, but the fact you're still holding on to the memories of your grandparents and your parents. And so they become completely dead uh, when only the last to have known them have gone. So in other words, as soon as ever, someone who, if you still have people alive who remember you, you're not completely dead. You only become completely dead, I suppose, when your uh, your graveside is not visited. Yes. History, I'm trying to say very badly, isn't instrumental. It's kind of um, lived. Mm. And well, so a lot of analysis of history is instrumental. It's going from a, a timeline. We teach children timelines rather than... We're talking about the lived experience. And his, mm. all the his, history analysis doesn't allow for that. It says, no, no, we're going from here to here to here, well, here like we're on a, a journey going down the M1. Well, that's true. But there is... There, I mean, the history has... Since, since the 19th century, when you're teaching students to learn about, yeah. you know, the, the Greeks and the Romans, and then, then the battles of the Middle Ages or something of that kind, and the narrative, yeah. as you say, the, the, the lives of great people so they can be inspired by them, or the lessons of history so you don't make those immoral, yeah. immoral mistakes again, or whatever. <coughs> so learning the, 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 you know, there were history books written called things like Great Lives, and, mm -hmm. you know, things that you could, things, you, things young men could be inspired by. But history now will be much more inclined towards agreeing with you, Dan, that, that history of domestic life, the history of women in the past, the history of childbirth, yeah. the history of um, the working yeah. class. You know, yeah. oh, you wouldn't you wouldn't have written the history of the working class. They're just the they just the lump and mass of people that lived and died and needed to be forgotten. You know, but now, but when you write the history of the working class, you're saying you're also doing something though quite ideological. So then, so then maybe you need to jump out of that. Say, so, well, everything in the past is history. So what what either we can know nothing about it. Or you can find the origins of the most important things in the past, which are the ideas. It's the ideas that float down to us. You know, that, that yeah, then, yeah. You can, then you come Foucault and his genealogy of ideas. Where did, why do we think the way we do? What, what, what is this fabric of ideology that, that forms these, the, the sea with which That's the food written? Yeah. And, and there, therefore, therefore yeah. the role of the historian is the history, is the historian of ideas more than the history more you know, than events. I do yeah. actually I'm fascinated by this sort of what people in the middle ages ate you know and I always, and always what I know when you go around stately homes the most interesting bit is the toilets you think oh yeah imagine that it's all great horrible great crapper that shot it out over the roof you know, or something like that or the kitchens because then then you empathise with the part you go, oh yeah but that free son of you know these were real people actually living like finding a footprint or a handprint on a wall or something. Oh, these real people actually living. Isn't the same as saying, well, why do I think the way I do? 
No, oh, that's, that's interesting. So you're saying forget the relic, the reliquary of the past, and the, and the old houses and the and the antiques, well, but think about the ideas that are still rubbing into us. Like yeah, and I think it's too much. But then again, because like we memory affects the, your childhood memory affects and informs, yeah, just, as the psychotherapist would say, it's your adult. It's emotional. It's very space, uh, the movie, the, the, the history of ideas, then, as opposed to the history of objects mm. and material things unfolding. I, I think here about uh, mythology, the history of mythology, and how that impacts. You know, the, the, mm. you know was it, what's it Campbell's thing, the hero of a thousand faces. You know, really, it's, it's really the it's a mono kind of idea, isn't it? Which has been interpreted culturally and historically, yeah, many times and repeated over and over again. And, and can we argue that that we we unfold our, our consciousness unfolds in a way that can be understood both mythologically and individually? So that, but that memory of consciousness yeah, yeah. is hard there because you know. Uh, you, you're not sure whether you're remembering it as it truly was, uh, and it's it, it's hard to I reclaim think, but, uh, that. Again, that, 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 that I think it's all, is, is there yeah. a truly was though? I think we, earlier you were saying there isn't a truly was because it, it, whatever whatever truly was was there was lost. Mm. You know? Yeah, <laughs> if, I, if I know what I'm talking about, the, 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 the past no. is another. Country. The past is another country. They did things differently. Yeah, I forget. It comes from yeah. the past is another country. It's lost to us. We can never know. It's really like to live, be a medieval peasant, mm. but we so we impose upon it what we think it was like, and it's fascinating and emotionally satisfying we, to do so. Yeah, but but, but it so is there, there never was a real past. Well, there's only actually, there was only a it, it, maybe past. even even at the time if you if you could get in Doctor Who's TARDIS and get out you wouldn't find the past because I remember my father, uh, my father when he was alive. He would. T- uh, he told me about Monte Cassino, the Battle of Monte. He was at the Battle of Monte Cassino in World War Two, and he said, oh, mm. "I said, uh, he said, I watched the Germans firing out of the firing out of the monastery, great monastery of Monte Cassino, the medieval monastery of Monte Cassino." And he said, "Well, he sat down there in the valley watching the Germans firing, and the bastards and they kept firing from the monastery." And, he said, and when the when the Americans came over and they obliterated it off the face of the earth, they they they, they, they rained bombs on the monastery. Considered one of the great cultural icon, great cultural uh, disasters mm. of World War Two. This this medieval monastery was obliterated to nothing. Now, almost every objective historian that's looked at it says the Germans didn't occupy the monastery, and they never fired a thing from it. But oh, down gosh. in the valley, when it was raining, you know, and you're looking up through the mist at those Germans, and they're firing these mortars down on them, and they're killing lots of people, lots and lots and lots of soldiers dying. My dad had the job of heaving the bodies out of the river tree. Ground. River Tri- Trigian, not Tri- River, River. Rapido, the Rapido River. He used to go by. He had a boat book and he was hooking the bodies out, all the people falling into the river. Yeah. And and stuff like that, you know, horrible stuff like that. But he, but of course he hated the Germans. And, it, and and they couldn't believe for a minute that the puffs of smoke or the things on the mountain. But if genuinely thought now there's absolutely rock solid evidence the Germans never occupied the monastery itself and it was bombed flat. He, but, and partly the Germans never occupied it. Because the commander in chief was a, of that particular region was a Catholic, and he didn't want the monastery to be damaged. <laughs> so anyway, so even yeah. I don't think I don't think being in the present gives you any particular understanding of the present. <laughs> What, a, what about, to, to change it slightly, of the his, history, sort of the philosophy of history and the formation of language as it changes over time? And, and here I'm thinking more, obviously, with the current issues that, that are happening in the Middle East, but Edward Said's stuff on uh, Orientalism and, and the way in which we can come to know recent histories and, you know, with, with, with the words, post-structural kind of arguments here of the way in which, um, you know, Said's argument that that the language that we use to understand somewhere like the Middle East is, is already inherently racist insofar as it's, yeah. it's, it's separating this idea of the known to the unknown, the mystical to the, to the sort of rational, the, 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 the barbarian to the, 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 the reasoned 
person. You know, it just it. And he, I've, I've just watched this. You know, just just recently with people talking about debates around the Middle East. You just see it in action. You know, you see people. You talk about people dying or being killed. You know, and it's kind of like this new, neutrality yeah. of our, of our words, neutrality of the way in which we speak. But when when you actually sit down and think about the language that's used both within the news and, and, I, and I don't just mean just right now obviously it, it, it's topical at the moment but if you look at when people talk about oh, the history of, of um, you know Israel Palestine when you actually look at the language that's being used it's uh, I, I think there's a lot of value there in, in Saeed's arguments and, and of which of course are are, are historically formed through through the West, if you like, the discourse, um, Stuart Hall called it, you know, the West and the rest, everything else mm. becomes mm. othered. And historically speaking there, this, this occurs because Saeed argues that, you know, rightly so as well, that we go over there and we take archives and we produce archives. It's just a very generation, generating a knowledge of something already skews. Just the, the, even the ability to speak about it has become formed through through that what yeah. about forgetting though what about the act of forgetting which is most of most of history well it's it's we, we can it's not it's like we, we can't we can talk about what's been forgotten but um, we, can't, we can't but it's that's the thing and we can't well, a memory that's gone is gone okay. it's like it's like a it's like something that's unseen you can't see it but that's that's, that's the then, thing. That, then, that, that isn't history, though, is it? That's not. It's that, isn't it? It's, it's that which we should not speak. We should remain silent. What's that? Wittgenstein. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all, <laughs> but it's almost like that, isn't it? I mean, so I, 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 just that, thought, I think for oh, yeah. me, oh, that's well. what that, the philosophy of history is. Is that yeah. yes, the, we, the past is very different from the present. The present has its problems epistemologically. The past has almost uh, impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, epistemological problems in terms of because it is subject to memory, and so it's yeah, it's, and, it's and, quite. I mean, Side's point would be sorry. Side's point would be it would be down to archive. It would be down to collected knowledge that knowledge has been produced on a group historically. I mean, look at look at colonialism. I mean, that's what that is, isn't it? But that yeah. archive is only seen in the present. Well, take take the 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 is, you know. So when when um, yeah. often often one of the processes of colonialization was to eliminate the histories of, that they found yeah. in countries like Central America and South America and so on. Their their artifacts were melted down, and uh, yes, and, and so on. And they were and and a new history was written. I mean, recently, very recently, Australia's just had a referendum: should they have a a, a voice for Aboriginal people or for origin for original people? To, to, to articulate their particular concerns, interests, and so on in a society that was generally sidelined those. Well, you know, up until the, some, somewhere in the 1960s or other, it was generally taught in Australian schools that Australia had been an empty country. That there'd been almost no human beings living there. And that was, again, presented to Europeans for a long time about North America. Certainly North America. It's very difficult to argue that in Central America, but North America would be a place where human beings have been fairly absent. They were sparsely populated yeah. by people that had, you know, a few, a few, a few wild children of the landscape. So, so they, the civilizations that, that colonialism encountered, the, one of the first things you do to destroy them is to negate or disregard their history. And that, that's a great way of obliterating a people is to. Mm. As you say, is, a, is the forgetting of that past. It's not as, yeah. as, as rich you say. It's not to archive their past, not to find it. It's a bit like in the Middle East, where um, yeah. you know, Israeli archaeologists will tend to dig through the Arab artifacts, can't chuck them on the old scrappy, and get to the get to the biblical history they find that, that proves a connection with a particular mm. bit of the past they want to. Exactly. They want to, to Can to I just add to that? Yeah. It, 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 um, obviously, Big Brother in George Orwell's 1984 makes exactly <laughs> yeah. the same point. I've got a yeah. quote here. Oh, yeah, um, okay. He said, he who controls talking to Winston, he who controls the present by controlling the past, since past events have, this is actual quote from Orwell, 
since past events have no objective existence but survive only in written records, your point, um, and in human memories. It follows that the past is whatever the records and the memories agree upon, and therefore whatever the party chooses to make it, recreated in whatever shape is needed at the moment. This new version is the past, and no different past can ever have existed. So, so to secure the party's infallibility, the past starting from yesterday has been actually abolished. Nothing exists except an endless present. So they go as far as the Dan, past does not exist. Look, actually, I've got to go, guys. Uh, I mean, Dan, yeah, uh, yeah that's, a, that's a, a great summary for that. There. That's a good place to end. Because yeah. I think, in a sense, though, it, though Orwell presents that as a horrifying image, it's probably actually a fairly good description of what Almost history Almost where is. we're moving to now, with individual histories. Yeah. And, and, but it's probably yeah. the reality of history. history there, the past, there yeah, is no past. I there is only so. a never-ending present. Yes. Yeah. I'll end it. I'll stop yeah. recording. <laughs> okay. And that brings to an end this episode of the Spinoza Triad. This week we discuss the philosophy of history. If you've enjoyed our discussion, please share links on social media, leave a comment. Join our Facebook page or listen again. We're available on Spotify and multiple other platforms. Thank you for listening. <laughs>